and you're supposed to automatically love everybody else who's accidentally born on that piece of land, and actually be prepared to go to war on their behalf with other people who were accidentally born on other pieces of land. What an incredibly bad and stupid idea. We are one family. We are all brothers and sisters. People are the same all over the world. We have the same hopes, the same fears, the same ambitions, the same capacity to love, and unfortunately the same ability to be manipulated by ideology. This is something that needs to be dealt with as we talk of emerging consciousness. We cannot allow ourselves to fall back into the old patterns of the past. We have to move on. And then of course there's the big corporations, which again are separating us <coughs> from their own control over our own lives, and the mass media spreading fear and hatred and suspicion around the world. It's largely the fear button that has led Britain to withdraw from the EEC. And, you know, we talk about democracy and what a wonderful thing it is, but you know, what actually triumphs in democracy are not the best ideas. What triumphs is the best propaganda. We are victims of highly sophisticated propaganda, and democracy is meaningless in that sense. Democracy has no meaning when your opinions are being manipulated by clever propaganda. Democracy only has a meaning if there's total transparency and honesty in the process, and we are far from that. So, all of these archonic forces have conspired in the 21st century to create what I would call a kind of consciousness monopoly. Uh, and giving an effective monopoly to a single state of consciousness and enforcing that mon monopoly with draconian criminal sanctions is, in my view, dangerous and possibly even suicidal for our species. Yes, we know that the alert problem-solving state of consciousness is useful. It does useful things. It's good for commerce. It's good for politics. It's good for warfare, which our species appears to be addicted to. Uh, but the endless, the, the promises of endless prosperity and of a bright future that we were offered if we only bought in to the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. We all already know that that's rubbish, that the banks cannot go on magically printing electronic money forever, that the system actually is broken already. It's just managing to preserve the appearance of still being intact. It's a system that allows this to happen, grotesque pollution, all around the world. Why? Because of the short-term pursuit of profit without any long-term thinking. It's truly only an insane system, a system that is absolutely unconscious and insane that could devise weapons like nuclear weapons. But to then compound that insanity by allowing those weapons to proliferate all around the world, I would say that's diagnostic. We live in a society that is psychopathic that is completely insane. Uh, and, and, and if we choose to buy into that society, then we're simply buying into the insanity. Uh, what's the point of talking about technological progress in any one country when millions go to bed starving every night? What's the point of that? We're all one human family. We've achieved nothing with Western technology. Nothing at all while this goes on in the world. It makes no sense. And then what about the clearances of, of the Amazon rainforest? Truly only an insane global system could allow that to occur. This precious habitat of biodiversity, to allow it to be cut down, to plant soya beans, to feed cattle so that we can eat hamburgers, it's a really insane idea. I mean, face it, this is madness. And, and it doesn't have to happen. We have a precious resource for the entire planet in the Amazon. It's economic needs that are driving the destruction of the Amazon. Were we a rational global society, we could meet those economic needs very easily and say to the peoples of the Amazon, preserve this wonderful resource for all of us. No need ever to cut down another tree. It wouldn't even cost that much money, actually. But you see, we're busy spending the money on these things. We're busy spending it on ever more sophisticated ways to murder one another in large numbers. And uh, our eye is not on the ball 
uh, of the preservation of the human future. If it's on anything, it's about the destruction of fellow human beings. Again, truly a sign of a society that is completely insane. So, you know, if we're going to move on to a new state of consciousness, we're certainly not going to do it with the mechanisms of the old state of consciousness. Um, Gnosticism is not going to help. It's been shattered by 2,000 years of persecution. There are places in the world uh, where a system of direct spiritual knowledge that taps into the same wellsprings remains very much alive. And one of those places is the Amazon rainforest, uh, where there are indeed uh, peoples who don't even know we exist. Uncontacted tribes, you know, who may look up one day and see some strange machine flying through the sky. That's us, you know, that's what we represent to them. And uh, when I've talked to shamans in the Amazon about this, asked them what's the problem in the world today, I was, I was given on one occasion just a very straightforward answer that uh, the problem is that. Those of us in advanced urban societies have severed our connection to spirit. Uh, and if we don't reconnect to spirit, then we're going to bring the whole house of cards down on our own heads and on the heads of everyone else in the world. That's why in the Amazon a remedy is proposed for this sickness, and that's why uh, we are now seeing a process of reverse missionary activity underway. It used to be the case that uh, People from the north traveled to the south to bring them the so-called good news about Christianity. Bad news, really. But uh, now we have another kind of missionary. We have shamans from the Amazon traveling to the west to bring us the remedy to our sickness. Ayahuasca, to bring us the remedy that can kick us out of our state of unconsciousness and madness and make us think again about the nature of uh, the nature of reality. Uh, and ayahuasca can be understood as a, as a portal to enchanted realms. And for those who have not drunk ayahuasca, uh, Pablo Amarillo's paintings give a sense, at least, of the of the realms of experience that we enter in ayahuasca vision. Um, of course, ayahuasca is. Um, very unpleasant to drink, at least I find it so. Um, I've, I've had, I suppose, not many, but perhaps 65 sessions with ayahuasca since 2003. I initially started drinking it as a research project because I needed to write a book about altered states of consciousness. I actually had my first experience with the psychedelic in 1974, it was LSD. The experience was so powerful that I stayed away from psychedelics way through until 2003 when I went to the Amazon and drank ayahuasca for the first time. And then I discovered that I was in the midst of a, a life-changing series of experiences. I enrolled myself unconsciously in some kind of school and I needed to learn more. So although I have to brace myself every time I drink ayahuasca, although it's not easy, I have continued to work with the brew and I try to have a session or two every year uh, if, if I can. Um, they do say with psychedelics, when you've got the message, hang up the phone. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I've got the message yet. I feel that I have, I have much more work to do with, uh, with Mother Aya. Uh, there's a very insistent message of ayahuasca. It's one of those universals that almost everyone who drinks the brew sooner or later reports. We can see it in the work of Alex Gray, greatly influenced by ayahuasca in the work of the late Robert Venosa. It's about the sacred, magical, enchanted nature of all creation and the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. Uh, very often you will hear people crying in ayahuasca ceremonies. This is um, to do with the, the life review that often takes place, certainly takes place for me, uh, where you are shown episodes from your life and the impact that you had on other people. And it turns out that that impact is quite different from the one that you persuaded yourself you were having. Actually, you weren't such a nice person. You weren't so nurturing and kind. You were completely ghastly. Uh, and, and your words caused pain. And, 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 and you were toxic. And ayahuasca shows you that. Shows you it uncompromisingly. 
it's, listen, it's a really hard work to change a lifetime of bad habits. Nobody should imagine that ayahuasca is instant enlightenment. It isn't. It's just the beginning of a process of work where you integrate the lessons that you've learned into your life and gradually the two begin to harmonize. It takes, it's certainly taking a long time for me, but you know, the sense is that the work is there to be done and I'm grateful to Ayahuasca for showing me the truth, not only about myself, but also I would suggest about the nature of reality. I was talking the other day to a friend who I drank Ayahuasca with, and he said, it's a bit like this. She comes to you and she says, I'm just going to show you a little glimpse of what it's really all about. <coughs> And then she sweeps open the curtains for a second and then closes them again. And in that glimpse you realize that nothing is what it seemed, that everything is different. This life of you, with the Vine of Souls, probably is one of the reasons why ayahuasca is so successful in getting people off addictions to hard drugs. Addiction is never about the substance, it's about the person, it's about the pain within that person. And, and I think it's the revelations that come with ayahuasca that, that uh, help to end addictions. Um, it's probably quite well known. I, I had a 24-year non-stop um, cannabis habit. Uh, ayahuasca made me, I mean literally made me give up cannabis for three years. I, I just quit it completely after a series of experiences in Brazil. Three years on, um, I get my toes back in the water, and I find I can work with cannabis today in a completely different way than when I worked before. Cannabis, I'm not putting the plant down. Cannabis is a wonderful sensual healing agent. It has a very positive role to play. My relationship with it was the problem, and I feel that ayahuasca helped me to fix that relationship. And after an interval, I've been able to go back to some cannabis use in a different form without uh, the negative effects that were there before. Um, the spirit of ayahuasca is most frequently encountered as a creative guide, as a healer, or as a moral teacher. Um, is, is this just our brains on drugs, or is something else going on here? Um, and really, what are we actually doing here? You know, what, what, what journey are we on? What is consciousness? What happens to me when I die? What is reality? Consciousness is one of the great mysteries of science. Don't let any scientist tell you that they've got consciousness worked out, because they haven't. Not at all. It's a, it's, it's a huge mystery. Certainly the brain is involved with consciousness. That, there's no doubt about. But does, does consciousness, is consciousness, you know, manufactured by the brain? The way that the generator makes electricity? That's the prevailing mainstream model. If you talk to a doctor about this, he'll say, of course, your brain makes consciousness. And you might say, why? And he says, well, look, if I damage a particular area of your brain, or if a virus damages a particular area of your brain, uh, your consciousness will be affected. Therefore, that proves the brain makes consciousness. Well, that's true. If you damage an area of the brain, your consciousness will be affected. But it doesn't prove that the brain makes consciousness. There's another possibility, which is that the relationship of consciousness to the brain is more like the relationship of the TV signal to the TV set. Sure enough, if you damage your TV set, the picture will be affected, but not the signal. The signal remains pure, unaffected, and untouched. Uh, and we don't know, actually, what the relationship between consciousness and the brain is. It's not, it's not clear at all. I personally favor the view that the brain is some kind of transceiver of consciousness rather than a manufacturer of consciousness. So Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD. By the way, those who say that LSD shortens your life, Albert Hoffman was the proof that that is not true, since he was a regular user of LSD and lived to the age of 102, with all his faculties intact. He wrote that reality is inconceivable without an experiencing subject. It's the product of the exterior world of the sender and of the receiver, an ego in whose deepest self, the emanations of the exterior world, registered by the antennae of the sense organs, become consciousness. So maybe there's more to the exterior world than our senses, even when extended by the finest scientific instruments, are normally able to receive. William Blake, famous 
quote then, the doors of perception. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. For man has closed himself up until he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Uh, William James, the brother of the novelist Henry James, great psychologist at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, <laughs> experimented with nitrous oxide, not a well-known psychedelic. Uh, nevertheless, he had some thoughts about the effect of nitrous oxide on his consciousness. And, and um, his point was that, that there are other states of consciousness, and that no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. At any rate, they forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. And I think that's what Western reductionist materialist science, science has done, is it's prematurely closed our accounts with reality. Not enough of those scientists uh, took psychedelics. Um, Aldous Huxley saw the brain as a reducing bar, really, which is designed to cut out most of reality. Otherwise, we'd just be flooded with the overwhelming impressions. But there are permanent or temporary bypasses to the reducing bar. And he saw psychedelics as one of those Bypasses, and through these permanent or temporary bypasses, there flows something more than, and above all, something different from the carefully selected utilitarian material which our narrow <coughs> individual minds regard as a complete or at least sufficient picture of reality. Back to Hoffman again, making explicit the notion of the brain as a, as a receiver of consciousness, and, and the true importance of LSD and related hallucinogens lies in their capacity to shift the wavelength setting of the receiving self and thereby to evoke alterations in reality consciousness. Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico uh, carried out a very well-known and very significant research project with dimethyltryptamine and human volunteers back in the 1990s. Rick still doesn't know how he managed to get permission to do that, but it was an incredible breakthrough. Uh, in, in, in many ways. And, and the conclusion that Rick uh, came to is that we are tuned in most of the time to what he calls channel normal, but that there are many other channels broadcasting at us all the time, uh, and that we can pick those channels up when we alter the receiver wavelength of the brain with, uh, with psychedelics. Um, and he's talking about these freestanding realms and the intelligent entities within them, and he's saying these worlds are usually invisible to us and our instruments and are not accessible using our normal state of consciousness. However, just as likely as the theory that these worlds exist only in our minds is that they are, in reality, outside us and freestanding. If we simply change our brain's receiving abilities, we can comprehend and interact with them. So, here is the idea of mainstream science. You give your volunteer a big dose of dimethyltryptamine or an LSD, for example, and then you stick them in an MRI scanner. Personally, I can't imagine anything worse than being stuck in an MRI scanner under the influence of LSD or DMT. The physician is standing outside the scanner looking at the screen. He witnesses physical changes taking place in the brain, in the electricity and chemistry of the brain. Certain areas light up. Inside the scanner, the volunteer is reporting the most extraordinary visions and encounters with entities, intelligent entities that are communicating with him. The physician says, ah, that's just your brain on drugs. That's just the changes that I'm observing in your brain. There's no reality to it whatsoever. That's actually an incredibly stupid and limited argument. Biology. If we wish to look at a very distant star, we're going to get a telescope first of all, and we're going to point it at the right region of the sky, and then we're going to focus the telescope. When we focus it, physical changes will take place inside the barrel of the telescope in the relationship between the lenses. Eventually the star will come into view. We'd be completely wrong to say that the star is the physical changes inside the barrel of the telescope. I'm sorry, the star cannot be reduced to that. The star is real. The physical changes just allowed us to see it. And that's the suggestion with DMT as well. That it is, and um, LSD, that they are introducing physical changes in the brain which allow us to gain access to a much wider reality than is normally 
available to us. <coughs> the 21st century really has little experience. We're, we're infants. 21st century science is infants in this realm. Uh, if we want to know about it, if we wish to learn, we have to sit at the feet of the shamans of tribal and hunter-gatherer societies. And altered states of consciousness, visionary states, trance states are the universal feature common to all shamanism. I'm running on a bit, but we started late. That's my excuse. In altered states of consciousness, it's very common for shamans to report encounters with intelligent supernatural entities, which are usually construed as spirits in shamanic societies. They sometimes take human form, sometimes take the form of animals, often they are perianthropes, part animal, part human in form, and shamans of all cultures also report that they themselves transform into animals or perianthropes during their trance journeys in the spirit world. Now, here's a mystery. Uh, many of the experiences that shamans report with spirits are very similar to the encounters with quote-unquote aliens reported by tens of thousands of people in the West who believe they've been abducted by UFOs. And as a matter of fact, if you look closely at Pablo Amaringo's paintings, uh, you will see, as well as Terianthros, uh, a lot of flying saucers uh, in those in those paintings. Um, up here, for example, here we have a bird-headed perianthrope, and here we have flying saucers. And my understanding from my limited communication with, with Pablo some years ago uh, is that he did not see those flying saucers as high-tech vehicles from other planets uh, bringing aliens here. Uh, he saw them as vehicles like the spirit canoe for entering and leaving the spirit world. Um, <coughs> vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. Now that's an interesting idea. When we talk about the spirit world, we're not so far away from notions of parallel realms or, or parallel dimensions. Maybe reality is much more complex than we think, and maybe there are other levels of reality, and maybe this phenomenon of the UFO abduction and the UFO experience is related to that rather than simply high-tech entities a bit like us coming from the other side of the universe. Maybe they're, maybe they're coming from the other side of reality. If we want to know about shamanism, the phenomenology of shamanism, Mircea Aliad's uh, great work is uh, a good place to start. And of course, if we want to know about the phenomenology of UFO abductions, we have a massive dossier. Uh, of modern UFO encounter reports. So we can compare the two. They seem like two very different domains. The spirits that shamans meet, the aliens that modern Western UFO abductees claim to have met. But if we look at the experience itself, we'll see that they're actually incredibly similar. Um, the spirits shamans encounter most frequently appear in the form of animals, birds or fish, or as theriantrums. It turns out that's the case with UFO abductions too. Virginia Horton remembered talking with an intelligent grey deer uh, just before she was abducted. Another one saw a deer, uh, another abductee saw a wolf. John Mack summarizes the aliens appear to be consummate shapeshifters, often appearing initially to the abductees as animals, owls, eagles, raccoons and deer are among the creatures the abductees have seen initially. Shamans report being floated up to objects in the sky, or climbing threads of light to objects in the sky. This is also a common feature of the UFO abduction experience, where specifically there are references to lines or threads of light that are climbed. Uh, Arthur, for example, saw light like a thread, a spider's thread that's lit extending down from the night sky. He saw a group of little lighted beings who told him, don't be afraid or it will break the thread. Next, Arthur found himself in the air in some way supported by the thread which seemed to go into the craft like a phone line or something. Uh, shamans, as well as being abducted to the sky, are often abducted underground or underwater. That turns out to be the case with UFO abductees as well. I won't read everything on the screen here, but there are multiple examples of UFO abductees being taken underwater or into caverns. 
uh, really the classic diagnostic feature of the shamanistic experience is the shamanic ordeal, where the shaman experiences himself or herself disassembled by the spirits, pierced, uh, objects placed under his or her skin, inserted into the, the brain, and so on and so forth. And this is really no different from the surgery that UFO abductees report uh, when they're abducted by, by uh, aliens. Um, there's an interesting case here. Sandra Larson was abducted by a UFO. Beings removed her brain and set it down beside her. Uh, in the case of a Yakut shaman cited by Elia, the spirits cut off his head, which they set aside. UFO abductees report bone counting experiences. Shamans report the same thing. And both shamans and UFO abductees report having objects inserted into their bodies and their brains by the spirits or the aliens, whichever you prefer to construe it as. Uh, shamans frequently reported being, report being abducted by spirits and having sex with spirits. In fact, sex with spirits is a very common aspect of the shamanic experience. And that's also a very common aspect of the UFO abduction experience. Most UFO abductees report a sexual element uh, to the encounter, sometimes a rape. Uh, sometimes they produce offspring, they're repeatedly re-abducted to nurture those offspring uh, in the UFO realm. Uh, this is the Wuppertzberg Codex from the 12th century. Here on the left is Alex Frey's cover for Rick Strassman's book, DMT, the Spirit Molecule. Eyes are a very common feature of the DMT experience. So it's interesting to see these eyes up here in the sky in this 12th century codex. And then we see that this object in the sky, whatever it is, is connected by some kind of umbilical cord to a fetus in the womb of this woman. And then up here, interestingly, is a mushroom with a little elf handling the mushroom. And what the hell is this? I mean, 1710, baptism of Christ. Well, that's like a flying saucer. I mean, what is going on there? Um, shamans are often given books by spirits. Maria Sabina, famous Mexican sh shaman, was given uh, a book by a spirit from which she learned many things and learned how to help people who need help and know the secrets of the world where everything is looked known. But the spirit wouldn't allow Maria to keep the book. She had to leave it in the sky. Same thing happened to UFO abductee Betty Hill. She was given a large book by the being she identified as the leaders, leader of the aliens, but he reclaimed it before she left the ship. Betty Andreasen was given a small blue book with 40 luminous pages, but soon afterwards it disappeared. And like shamans, many UFO abductees return with a sense that they have enhanced healing powers, that they have a mission in the world today. Uh, what if there is an elves? And, uh, why do they have so much in common with <coughs> aliens and spirits? The great work on this is Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée. I highly recommend it. He closed that book in 1969. In my own book, Supernatural, I took that dossier of evidence forward into the 21st century, uh, but it's essentially the same story. Um, from the Middle Ages until the 20th century, fairies, just like spirits, just like aliens, were renowned and feared for abducting people. You didn't want to get close to the place where the fairies were dancing in a ring. If you touch that ring, you will be drawn into another world. Instantly. And in that other world, you might spend an entertaining few hours. You might be given food, you might have sex with a fairy, uh, and then they say, okay, you can go back now, and you go home. But 500 years have passed. You were just a memory, and the new village you came from has fallen into dust. It's a bit like the missing time phenomenon with modern UFO abductees, except in these days, you usually only lose five hours, not 500 years. As though the abduction experience has become uh, gentler. Uh, fairies could be cruel and tortured and hurt human beings, but they also were kind and gay gifts to people, healing powers, for example. Uh, like aliens and spirits, fairies have the power of flight, and they use of aerial vehicles, flying boats, flying castles, flying carriages, etc. Uh, fairy abductions were frequently underground, 
Uh, in both of these images of fairy abductions, we see interesting mushrooms uh, present in the image. Fairies often took the form of theriathropes, part animal, part human in form. This is Medusine, a feared medieval fairy who abducted human babies. Uh, she's part serpent, part human uh, in form, a classic theriathrope. Here's a group of fairies dancing in a ring, woodcut from Holland, 15th century. What are they? Theriathropes, part animal, part human in form, classic creatures of vision. So it's obvious to me that the fairy imagery and the cave art must have been inspired by similar experiences. Uh, and again, there are compelling crossovers with those reports from UFO abductees. Uh, here's an image from Angoulême in France, 27,000 years ago, this hint of a dark eye, a high-browed forehead, narrow-pointed chin. Uh, here from Peshmerl, very curious figure. Something in the sky above it, this is 24,000 years old. If we home in on that face, uh, I find that, that redraw it, it looks an awful lot like the modern view of the grey that uh, is reported in the UFO abduction uh, stories. And then there are, um, sorry, there are images in the painted caves like this and like this, which nobody's been able to identify, but they look an awful lot like those vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world that Pablo Alvarico painted. Uh, out of these three images, one was drawn in the 1990s by a modern UFO abductee. She said that every time she was abducted, that image was projected into her visual field just before she was taken away. The other two are from the painted caves, uh, and they're more than 15,000 years old. Uh, this is the modern image, and these are the ancient images. It looks to me they were inspired by the same experiences. And then Rick Strassman's work, at the University of New Mexico. Uh, more than half of his volunteers reported experiences that are indistinguishable from the experiences reported by UFO abductees. Except we know they weren't being abducted because they were lying on a hospital bed in the University of New Mexico. But it seems their consciousness was being abducted. So Lucas finds himself above a space station. There were at least two presences on either side of me guiding me to the platform. I was aware of many entities inside the space station, etc., etc. Carl saw a lot of prankish, ornery elves. Ben had an object inserted into his left forearm. Jim had long fiber optic things that were put into his pupils. All of these are very typical of the alien abduction experience. As you can see here, in the lower right, I cannot draw. I have no artistic ability whatsoever. Uh, nevertheless, on one of my ayahuasca journeys in the Amazon jungle, I encountered an entity that looked like this, and I did see flying saucers. I was sitting on a bench, and this was all going on above me, and I became terrified. And I became certain that I was going to be abducted. And I opened my eyes, and I shouted, no! And the whole vision vanished. Of course, what I should have done was kept my eyes closed and shouted, yes! But my courage failed me. Since then, I've had many other visions, but these guys have never been back. Um, interestingly, a number of Rick Strassman's volunteers who at that time weren't comparing notes, reported almost the same communication from the entities they encountered. And what those entities said was, we are so glad you discovered this technology. Now we can communicate with you much more easily. Thought-provoking, at the least. DMT is an entirely natural product of the human body. We are all illegal in this room. <laughs> Uh, it's found in blood, plasma, urine, cerebral spinal fluid. We don't know its function because there's really been very little research apart from Rick Strassman's work. But it's there. Uh, where is it produced? Well, there's a connection with the pineal gland. The science doesn't say that DMT is produced in the pineal gland. The lungs are clearly involved as well. But, but uh, the association with it has been found, for example, in the pineal glands of rats. 
Um, it's interesting that in evolutionary older animals like lizards and amphibians, the pineal is the third eye. It actually possesses a lens, a cornea, and a retina. In humans, it's descended much more deeply into the brain. It's not light sensitive anymore. But maybe DMT is its lens. Maybe DMT is giving us a kind of sixth sense. Maybe that's what it's for, which our society is now so vigorously trying to suppress. Um, Strassman recognized the remarkable similarities between the experiences of UFO abductees and the uh, reports of his own volunteers. Uh, and he proposed that UFO abductees might be spontaneous overproducers of endogenous DMT. But it's important to be clear that Rick Strassman was at pains to emphasize that this did not imply that the experiences mediated by DMT were in any way unreal. Uh, he said, by conceiving of the brain as a receiver of information, one can accommodate the biological model of changing brain function with a chemical. At the same time, it allows for the possibility that what is being received, while not usually perceptible, is consistently and verifiably existent for a large number of individuals. It may indeed reflect stable, freestanding, and parallel planes of reality. We human beings can't see anything without interpreting it. Interpretation and perception go hand in hand from the get-go. And when we interpret a perception, we inevitably do so according to our own cultural background. I would suggest that the experiences of shamans with spirits, the experiences of modern UFO abductees with so-called aliens, the experience of medieval people with fairies and elves, it's all one experience seen through different cultural spectacles at different periods of history. And from time to time, down the millennia, it has brought us the forbidden fruit of gnosis and reawakened us to the true nature of things. Um, since we started late, I'm going to carry on for another 15 minutes, because I'm nearly there. I want to just throw um, a piece of devil's advocacy into the work. Um, are all the different techniques and substances for altering consciousness really portals to other worlds and dimensions, as shamans and increasingly some scientists believe? Or could there be some other explanation? When I've talked to scientists about this, about the universal experiences in altered states of consciousness, many of them argue that we must have a brain module for this, that it's it's the universality of the human brain that explains these universal experiences. Uh, and, and we do indeed have brain modules for all kinds of things. Uh, we have intuitive physics, for example. All of us are capable of doing really complex physics calculations in our brains without even knowing we're doing them. It's, after all, a complex physics calculation. If somebody picks up a rock and throws it at you, it's a complex uh, physics calculation to avoid that rock. We're assessing the trajectory, the weight of the object, the speed of the object, the angle of the throw, all of that in an instant, and we can avoid it. We can push that rock aside or step away from it. And I can understand that in evolutionary terms, because if our ancestors didn't have rock dodging genes, then they would have been less likely to pass on their genes to the next generation, because they'd be hit by rocks. I get it. But why would we have a brain module for therianthropes and, and, and uh, you know, uh, abductions by spirits and fairies and aliens? And why would these spirit molecules only be activated in altered states of consciousness? What possible use could they be? I refer you to the work of Francis Crick, the, uh, one of the discoveries of the double helix of uh, DNA. A man who presumably knew what he was talking about when he talked about DNA. And in 1981, Francis Crick published a book called Life Itself, Its Origin and Nature, in which he argued that the DNA molecule about which he knew so much could not have evolved on this planet. See, the general view is that there was a kind of primeval soup on the early Earth, and Molecules accidentally bumping against one another produced the DNA RNA system that is the basis of all life. Crick and, and also Sir Fred Hoyle 
uh, held the view that you would be more likely to get uh, a fully functioning and flying jumbo jet by passing a hurricane through a junkyard than you would be to get the DNA molecule assembling itself in the limited time available in the early Earth. Because it's thought that the Earth was too hot to support life until about 4 billion years ago. But with one, within 100 million years of that, the whole Earth was covered with bacterial life. Uh, and in Crick's view, that was too short a time to evolve the DNA molecule. So he suggested that, look, it's been nearly 14 billion years since the Big Bang. There was time for life to have evolved elsewhere in the universe. And what he speculated was, and this is Crick, this is not me, okay? This is the Nobel Prize winner who speculated this. He speculated that far away on the other side of the universe, in another galaxy, uh, there was a planet on which the DNA system had had time to evolve. But then the, uh, it eventually evolved into intelligent, highly advanced beings. But then those beings discovered that their planet was going to be sterilized, destroyed, by perhaps a supernova explosion in their vicinity. So their first thought would be to get their bodies off the planet. But they found they couldn't do that. The distances were too great in interstellar space. So Crick suggested that what they would then do is they would try to preserve the seeds of life that they would pack into cryogenic chambers, genetically engineered bacteria, and they would fire them off in all directions into the universe. And this is Crick's suggestion that 4 billion years ago, or 3.9 billion years ago, one of those craft hit the early Earth, spilled out its contents of bacteria, and 4 billion years later, here we are, the result of that process. It's called directed panspermia. Um, in other words, basically, that's what Crick was saying. I actually don't, I, I'm not a big fan of the idea, but it's, it's worth thinking about. DNA, incredibly complicated in a way, incredibly simple, a code, uh, and as we know, 97% of DNA until recently has been referred to as junk DNA. Of course, it's not junk. Uh, but there's an interesting aspect of coding DNA, the DNA that makes proteins, and non-coding DNA, the so-called junk DNA. And this is that there's a linguistic law called Zipf's law, which applies to all human languages. And it's to do with the rank and frequency of the word. If a word rank 1 appears 10,000 times, the word rank 10 will appear 1,000 times, the word rank 100 will appear 100 times. Uh, and it turns out that in so-called junk DNA, that ratio that is found in all human languages also appears. Uh, it is not found in coding DNA. So I talked to Eugene Stanley, who, who wrote about this in Science magazine back in 1994, and I asked him, what actually do you really think is going on? And he lowered his voice and he said, I think there's a message written in our DNA. Now that's an interesting idea, because DNA, uh, we are now finding, is uh, a phenomenal storage medium. In fact, it's possible to, it would be possible to store the entire knowledge of a civilization in DNA. So to take Crick's suggestion to the ultimate, DNA comes here by directed panspermia, and that DNA already contains information from the advanced civilization that created it. And maybe we can only access that information in deeply altered states of consciousness. In other words, it's not a freestanding parallel reality, it's not a doorway to other realms, it's a hidden archive within our own minds and bodies. I prefer the notion of other realms, freestanding other realities. Uh, but, you know, whether it's a hidden archive or, or a doorway, there's no doubt that psychedelics are much more than just brain candy. Psychedelics can be transformatory, utterly transformatory, used in the right way, responsibly, with care, with love, with the right intent. And uh, we're beginning to see science catching up with this, recognition of uh, the important therapeutic potential of psychedelics. <coughs> Let's not forget that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who created the Apple computer, were great users of psychedelics. Uh, Steve Jobs would often end a job interview 
when he interviewed a programmer, the first question he would ask them was, have you taken LSD? If the programmer hadn't taken LSD, there was no job for that person. Uh, because he knew that, that, uh, that these were helpful experiences. Steve uh, Wozniak told Time Magazine how he got the concept of Apple during an LSD trip. Uh, Francis Crick was a big user of LSD in the 50s, and when it was legal, and uh, he reported that he had per first perceived the double helix shape while on LSD. Now, that's not to say there wasn't a lot of other work done, because there was a huge amount of brilliant scientific work, but what Francis Crick appeared to be saying was that the first time he really got it was under an LSD experience. In other words, that this great breakthrough owes as much to visionary states of consciousness as it does to rational materialist science. So, let's return to the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, good and evil, essential for the progress of the soul. And let's remember, again, the character of the serpent as a classic creature of vision who brings Gnosis to Adam and Eve. And if we go back to the biblical text, there's a really chilling paragraph in Genesis 3, 24, a chilling verse, uh, where the entity who the Gnostics recognized as the Demiurge, who we mistakenly call God, drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And there's a passage there where that entity explains why he's kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden. Lest they discover the tree of life and become gods like us. Who are those us? Somewhere in this, the mystery of knowledge of good and evil and the mystery of immortal life lie concealed. And what's at stake is no small thing. A struggle is underway for the future direction of human consciousness. Our society will imprison us for making use of time-honored sacred plants to explore our own consciousness. Yet surely it's our consciousness that is the essence of ourselves. It's our consciousness that is the essence of being human. It's not our stomachs or our knees or our shoulders. It's our consciousness that is the essence of being human. And by demonizing and persecuting altered states of consciousness today, we may be denying ourselves the next vital step in our own evolution. If we're going to heal the planet, the first thing we need to do is to re-establish sovereignty over consciousness. The state has no place inside our heads those states that have caused so much chaos and misery in the world, stay out of human consciousness. Otherwise, if we let the process go on as it's going now, the policing of our consciousness by bureaucrats, who knows, we may become the next lost civilization. Thank you. Thank you.